indicator. Oh, no way. So, it's, I need to add that somewhere. <laughs> so this is the, the same setup from like back in the day where Trust was doing a lot of development on the GTR. And uh, they added this sequential transmission for drag racing. And, oh, this uh, is so cool. What's up guys, Larry Chen here. Welcome to my YouTube channel. We got Kenji here from Greddy. Hi guys, he's a, he's a good friend <laughs> and I've photographed many of his builds, many of his cars. And actually I've photographed you also for many years because you ran a Formula Drift team. Yeah, with Ken Gucci. So today we're here to talk to you about a very, very personal car, very personal build, very, very historic build for you. Yeah. It's a... Um, pretty bedazzled r33 <laughs> gtr yeah um it looks pretty wild actually it honestly looks like it came out of hot import nights mm. maybe i don't know 10 15 years ago right. but um what's the story behind this car well so i've been telling a lot of the guys um this was my very first project when i started working here and back in 1995 they sent me to trust for six months for training and kind of testing what I know and what they I sent you do. to Japan Japan Tr okay trust Japan got it and as soon as I arrived this car was still bare chassis already painted but bare chassis on a jack stand and said Kenji you're gonna help build this it's like what you know so I was like totally privileged to and honored to to be part of this there was about six guys work on the R&D team working on this and I got to be you know with that group and some of these guys have been, you know, at Trust from day one, Trust racing team, Le Mans, the, the Porsche and the Toyotas, the Group C cars. So those same guys that I followed when I was all, you know, getting into cars and you know, I get, got to work, you know, right alongside with them and build this car. And the first goal was to build this car for the Yatabe 300 kilometer challenge wow. you know that oval track yes, the bank yeah. the oval track and then go to auto salon and i went to september and that's where it all started and the goal was in december you know make this run so from bare chassis and then you know build the whole interior build a motor i got to build one of the motors we went through so many motors it was pretty crazy but uh, well, because when you know when you say the timeline and you talk about the year mm. 1995 is the first year of the r33 yes. gtr brand new. so how, you guys got like a brand new body in white yeah or, or no no just they just bought it purchased uh -huh. it it was actually a 95 v-spec and it was white and they just started stripping it yeah. incredible yeah i mean just, it's it's pretty common to do that now yeah but back then i'm sure it was yeah. pretty crazy yeah. too so that was pretty much like the the peak of you know the whole tuning scene in japan and trust was you know right after the 32 which they did a lot of development on which called the rx the blue one that came here for battle of the imports back in 95 as well you know they did a lot of development on that and just <laughs> When the 33 came out, that was like probably the, the peak of the tuning scene in Japan. So, you know, a lot of the tuning companies like you know, Trust and HKS and Blitz and, you know, a few others um, went out and this Yatabe Challenge was the spot to test their, you know, development and build. So, you know, it's pretty exciting to be part of that team and, and got to go to that race. And uh, that's pretty much how I started working here. So. Okay, so all these years later, mm -hmm. what happened after uh, auto salon after you took it to auto salon yeah. after auto happened? salon um, trust started developing more there's you know a lot of issues to 
work out. So they went to Yatabe, I think, three, three or four more times. And after that, they got into more drag racing. So initially, it was P67 Twins for that top speed. But when they did the, started getting into more of the drag racing and they started uh, you know, having an event called the Battle of the Gretty, and they got all the Gretty you know, tuners and you know, started doing drag racing, that's when they went to single. Uh, sequential transmission, and they did you know a few other things to develop you know products for for this platform and RB26, and then uh, you know just kind of the 34 came and that whole scene kind of you know kind of died a little bit. The drag racing died a little bit, and uh, um, they started working on other projects. So it kind of sat for a while, and then it eventually got sold to some museum in Japan and we didn't hear about the car for long as time and i remember it being in the auction like 10 10 years ago last i heard it was like it got sold and to the private owner so it was kind of like long gone and we were always wondering um, about the car so then you were tasked with finding it H how did it end up here yes yeah, so it's very funny like you know with the social media these days and one one time, like a year ago, year and a half ago, I just did one of those Throwback Thursday, and you know, this is the you know first car, you know my, you know I'm, I love R33s because of this you know reason, but I just made a post and I started getting a lot of comments and also DMs from in Spanish at first, and I couldn't understand it. Like, who are these people, right? Then I started kind of translating, like. You know some of the comments and, and like it's in paraguay like what and then the owner uh martin from top drive performance in paraguay they have a shop said i own this car like no way so he you know started communicating and he started showing me pictures and the current condition and it looks still clean as it did back then and we started talking back and forth and uh my friend good friend Art at Hive Auto told them that I found the car would you be interested in that he's like hell yes you know so we started talking and you know asked the owner if he'd be interested in selling it he's like oh he was kind of hesitant at first he said if it's going to go back to Grady that that's a perfect story so they just make me an offer and here it is now today so you know from coming from Paraguay I was kind of skeptical and like, how are we going to ship that? You know, in the ocean container, I heard it, it takes like two, three months. And because of the, the whole logistic nightmare that's going on, it was kind of like, you know, we were kind of worried about that. So, you know, let's just air it, you know. Well, you flew it over. So we flew this over. So if you follow my Instagram, there's a picture of this coming off the plane on a, you know, big metal pallet, you know. So from Paraguay, I went to Chile, and then from Chile, I went to Miami, and Miami International, and then got transported to Hive directly. So that one weekend that you were out of town, but we had this car, the Carbon GTR, a few other like top secret cars, all, you know, like a mini auto salon at Hive uh, last month. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty perfect event for, you know, bringing something like this. It came directly into this, it was Saturday event, it landed, 12 o'clock noon to, to Hive. No way. Yeah. Was, With everybody there? Uh, no, the oh. event was from four. Oh, okay, so, all right. Yeah, I got to you know clean it up a little yeah. bit. Yeah, uh, all the guys at Hive, Diego, we have the most respect and love for you guys. Um, they're very, they have like this, this open door policy. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of, actually a lot of people tell me that if they're in the San Diego area, they're into cars they go by and they let them look at the cars and yeah. stuff. You know, it's cars that we could only dream of. I can only dream of mm -hmm. owning and driving and enjoying. The fact that they're open about it, it's super cool. So now yeah. they own this. This mm -hmm. is in their collection. They yeah. have already, I think, probably the most expensive R33 <laughs> GTR in the world. It's a yeah. very clean 400R, mm -hmm. very low miles that I probably put a quarter mile on. Right. <laughs> but, um, right. Let, let's talk about the build in itself. So uh -huh. this is the one that made you. This is the one that started you at Gretty, and you proved yourself with this build. Yeah. So let, let's talk about this build. First of all, let's talk about the outside. Yeah. This is 
This was painted in 1995? Yes. It's and wild, it's, is it? It's is still it? this yeah. nice. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, it shows some age, like cracking. So this thing, because of the glitter flakes, they paint the base coat and then dust the, the, the glitter and then clear coat it. So there's a lot of, to make it smooth, there's probably over 10 coats of clear. Probably more than that. I see. So it's not like the put the flake in the paint. Yeah. You actually have they, to add they, yeah. dust. Yeah. They dust it on there. So it's it's pretty pretty wild. So the car, probably the paint alone probably weighs about 50, 60 pounds maybe, um, if not more. So it's pretty pretty crazy. It's incredible to mm. me though the metal bits. Mm the condition it's in it's it's really 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 good yeah i mean just aside from the bumper i think everything else is pretty intact yeah. and i also there's really there's a lot of cracks on the roof but I mean, we're going to try to see if we could kind of fix that and fill it but yeah you kind of see yeah how thick the clear is from mm -hmm. just looking at the cracks right yeah got it yeah. but the fact that they did the door handle like mm -hmm. this yeah and every little bit of it mm -hmm. And also, I'm guessing you guys used new rubber and yeah. everything. All yeah, trimmed. so this was completely stripped, bare chassis, and you know, it was spot welded all the seams. No way. So from the 32, when they used to race that, they had a lot of body flex. So they learned from that. And when they started building this, they completely stripped it and just reinforced all the seams panels. So it's all spot welded to, you know, for strengthening the uh, the chassis, and then they painted it. So it's completely painted inside out, even under the carpet. Like Wait, in the so trunk. under the carpet is yeah. not this flake. It's, no, um, it's it is, it is painted that way. See that? Really? Oh, so you, you kind of see the, oh, okay. the, the base I, coat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? It's still that uh, mm. blue. Yeah, but not the. But the it doesn't have the flake yeah. in it. Yeah. This is incredible. Yeah. I, I just can't believe how much attention to detail they went through mm. to to even do the door jams and everything. Yeah, back in 95. So. so cool. So tell me about the kit. So this is the Gretti um, Gracer body kit that they had. And we still actually sell this but bumper and the side skirt. The rear wing, the double decker, we don't have that anymore. But the front bumper and the side skirt still available. That's incredible. Yeah. Designed in 1995, yeah. still available today. Mm. And it's making a comeback. So we, we have brought some of these kits in. This wing is that, so that good. Though. 95, 96 are, are legal here in the state side. So it's going to be one of the popular. I know top rank has like 15, 32s or 33s right now or something like that. We're picking up another one for another build. So that'd be is, fun too. This is so cool. I just love the double decker <laughs> yeah. and it's adjustable too. So this is yeah. functional. Yeah. Let's talk about the wheel and tire combo here. So this is the wheels that was put on there right before it was sold. It had a few other wheels and back in uh, 95 to 99 or so, we had the Amcrid wheels made by uh, work. That was the, I'm hunting for those right now. Okay, so because you, you want to... G7s are... You, you want to bring it back to what it was yeah. uh, when it first mm -hmm. I mean, uh, this is... They, they ran this these wheels for a while, too, so it's still the original wheels. You could even see the R&D marks is, you know, the set number three, right. rear right. Yeah, it actually so, says it. Here. Right, so it's still the, the ones that they used to run, but my favorite was the, the work wheels that they had, the Amcreed. So Amcre was the kind of like the Gretti Pro Shop, like the Tuna Association that Gretti put together or trust in Japan, and they would hold events like drag racing or you know track days, and they made like the the group collab wheel with works and uh, work wheel, and that's the one that uh, I'm hunting for. So after all these years, I'm wondering if that's original. Yeah, these are original. Original Sticker. decals yeah. Yeah. too from yeah. back then. Mm -hmm. It's, I guess, it was really taken care of. It was garaged. Yeah, because I think because it got sold to a museum first, so it got you know stored, and then it got sold to a collector that he pretty much garaged it even in Paraguay. 
I saw some like red dirt. So, I mean, they drove it around, but they still kept it, you know, nice and clean and um, stored, so. And of course you had to have big brakes. You had to have these outcom brakes because you were going for top speed runs. Yeah. Uh, do you remember what this got up to top speed wise? Well, it was the fastest, the time two, 300 kilometer, but I, 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 I don't quite remember. It wasn't like the fastest. There was a lot of tuner shops that was much faster. And I think, you know, part of the, the reason with this one was just so heavy, the car. Oh, oh got it. So it, it was a competition to get to 300K first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Huh, can we take a look at the engine bay? Yeah. It's amazing to me that it was, it's just of era mm -hmm. and it's making a comeback. Yeah. All of this styling, like, Look at this engine bay. Yeah. All of this is painted. <laughs> yeah. Even the shock towers, all of this really incredible just glistens. Um, so like you said, you guys went through a lot of engines during yeah. the development of yeah. this vehicle. I think the tuning um, solution back then was like ROM tune. There wasn't really like a full standalone back then either. It was that whole market was just starting right for the whole full standalone type of ECU. So this was initially like all just ROM tune. And I remember even like the data logging system was so, you know, huge and um, expensive. I remember the first time we dyno this car, we had two guys, well, driver and the passenger and two guys in the back seat. And if you see all the gauges in, in the, you know, the cluster, each of us will be in charge of looking at two gauges and we'll go 500 RPM at a time on the dyno, the driver will honk and we would, there's a guy on the side writing down all the data. We would like, you know, yell out the, the boost was so-and-so, the EGT was so-and-so, the oil pressure so-and-so, and it will go up 500 RPM at a time. And there's a guy with a timing gun on the dyno, you know, reading out the, ignition timing even because that's how old school the, you know, the technology wasn't really there for, you know, data logging yet. So that's how we were, you know, tune these things. And then there's a guy on the side writing, you know, the ROM tune, you know, chip to go, okay, try this out. So like, we'll be doing like multiple night overnight, you know, all nighters, just, you know, even tuning it at, at that level where, you know, we're pushing 900 horsepower back then was a pretty big deal, 2.7 liter, set up and you know testing out new things so it sounds kind of crazy to hear that today but that's what we had to go through to kind of take it to the next level and learn about you know the different systems or new components we had additional injectors and a standalone sub injector controller to you know add more fuel because the the stock ecu couldn't handle bigger injectors so you know things like that um, and then it just kind of evolved over time and now we today we all we got to do is plug in a, a Haltech or Motec and just you know go at it and you got somebody on you know remote tuning and stuff like that so you know it has come a long way but this kind of goes and takes me back to where we come from you know and how this whole industry kind of evolved it, so it's a good great reminder of but it's incredible that you guys were doing all of this so long ago mm and you were still making good power. Yeah. And yeah. I'm guessing reliable enough power, but mm. also everything else. Yeah. Suspension technology, tire technology, mm. brake technology, all of that. Yeah. It's like it all needed to catch up it's to the good. amount of power you were making. You were already yeah. making good power. Yeah. That's... Some of the guys in Japan. So that's, you know, we were all like for me, I followed them from option magazines and option videos and we had no internet so that's pretty much where we got all our information and you know to be part of that when you know, when i remember when they first brought the 32 i was at battle of imports with my honda civic and i remember they were the first one to bring a skyline to the state side and actually run it and then rest of the tuners followed like apex brought their drag 33 hks brought their cars and you know, and then it really took off our, our market here too. So around that time is when even our business here at Grady 
really took off. Even though we didn't have these cars here, but all the rest of the parts for like 300ZX, ARC-7s, um, Supras, and our, believe it or not, our bread and butter was Hondas because we started doing all the R&D here. But you know, bringing something like this to the States really took off the whole import scene. And Frank Choi from Battle of the Imports back then was talking to the president at the time, like we need to bring more Japanese cars. So we brought this car back in 98, 97, 98. For oh, the so this was in the States, States for, for a little bit. Okay. So it got on the Turbo Magazine cover. We had a big poster. So a lot of guys that has been around since then, they'll probably have or had a poster of this from Turbo Magazine. Hmm. All right. So in its current configuration, mm -hmm. did the previous owner touch it at all? No, he kept it as is. He didn't touch anything. Okay, so yeah. what are we looking at here? Is this a, a 2.7 liter? Yes. So it's bored out to 86.5, 2.7. It's fairly, you know, compared to what, what we have today, like stroker kits, it's still more like a, a subtle setup with a single T88, 38GK, uh, one of the first uh, turbos that came with a billet wheel back in the day kind of like a prehistoric turbo today compared to what's available today, but it's kind of making a comeback. You know, still guys in Japan still use a lot of the Grady Mitsubishi turbos, um, but over here we got a lot of different, you know, newer technology turbos with the ball bearing and, you know, Garrett has some, you know, great new turbos and Borg Warner we've uh, used on Ken Gushi's car. So, you know, there's a lot to choose from, but when you're building something like this and putting it to like a period correct setup. You know, it still makes good, great power. It's just a matter of, you know, tuning it right and you could really enjoy these cars. But uh, yeah, T88, we got, uh, we don't have this anymore, but got the intake manifold. It's about 1.5 times more than the, the uh, stock uh, volume. Do you guys have an updated version? So we that? have an updated version, but not as big because we don't, you know, not that many people are especially in Japan, not pushing for huge numbers anymore. So it's not that, that big. So we kind of downsized it and it's all sheet metal welded instead of a cast piece. But it's a good looking piece. It looks OEM. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, parts like this was, you know, being developed because of you know, these platforms. It's just so cool. I mean, like all of this is period, yeah. all these gritty parts. I'm sure it's you got to see the, the, how big this intercooler is. You can't really see it, but intercooler is this thick. It's called our five row intercooler. It's basically that thick. How does it even let any <laughs> air through to cool the engine down? Oh, uh, because of the tube and fin, we still got a lot of good flow. So there's two types of intercoolers, right? There's tube and fin and bar and plate. Mm -hmm. um, where bar and plate, you got the stacks just kind of um, the square stacks. Um, stacked up and then you know fused together and this one has more of a rounded tube so it got a little bit better aerodynamic as oh, far as like airflow so it, it lets the air go through the core got it that is a and huge, it's much lighter too there's a material. huge oil cooler so yeah this oil cooler mm -hmm. is as big as uh <laughs> radiators on yeah. a lot of hondas right actually probably bigger look at that thing right it's like a like an EK radiator yeah, size. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, a lot cool. of things, you know, back then, they were, you know, th th when they were pushing, they wanted to kind of make sure everything's good. So some parts might look overkill, but, you know, still functional and, you know, efficient. And, you know, we might update a few things on this car now that that's here. We yeah, so that, to... that's a really good uh, point. Mm -hmm. And this is something I wanted to ask. You know, you'll probably clean up some of the mm -hmm. areas that are worn, mm -hmm. but what would you do to all of this old tuning parts yeah. that you can't get anymore? Yeah, well, I mean, I think we're trying to go back to the twin setup. So we might actually go back to the t twin T67s. Um, I like that layout much better. I'll show you what it looks like. And I have a magazine from 1996 that featured the, the, you know, the previous setup package wise, it looks, you know, nice, but I think we're gonna still kind of, you know, just restore and kind of retain 
as you know the original as much as possible by updating few things to more you know current setup, especially like the f fuel management and fuel system. Um, and yeah, then, yeah. So, uh, are you going to update the ECU maybe too? Yeah, it's a, it's sure. probably a safety thing at this point yeah, too. Like exactly, you, you don't want to blow motors left yeah. and right. Yeah, and just making sure everything's you know tuned properly. Um, compares to like ROM tune back in the day. Mm. Just you know, there's so many things that it, even like a safety feature that we could add. You know, so <laughs> this the super '90s is interior. so. 90s yeah no. this is i was you know, already surprised back then when i showed up and they told me that we're going to be working on this car and when things are starting to you know parts starting to come come in and already the paint job was like whoa this is crazy i've never seen anything like this and still today even maybe you know they'll wrap it the car with the crazy colors you know like chrome film and all that but this is painted this way so it was already crazy enough then when the seats and the interior pieces came in, oh, I was like, wow, that's kind of, you know, pretty crazy. And even these seat belt had seat belt pad that's not on there anymore, but it had pink, you know, pads on <laughs> no there. Way. So if you, you know, find some magazine from back in the day, it'll, it'll show that. But, you know, it was, it was pretty wild. But Trust was always known to be pretty flashy back then, too. And, you know, just kind of kept that theme. So like even the jackets from Auto Salon, when we debuted this, we had like pink jackets, orange jackets, you know, so pretty loud, right? Really so, standing out. Yeah. So that's, that, they were kind of known for that too back then. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Ricardo just uh, reupholstered into this yellow and blue. Blue is pretty much the, the gritty color, but then, you know, added the, the yellow and Still pretty decent. Still, you know, have sign of you know wear over the, the years, but I mean the fact that they did the entire back seat, the stock, mm -hmm. they wrapped all or or they uh, reupholstered the the stock mm -hmm. R33 seats instead of running a cage or anything. So yeah. this never actually had a cage either, no. huh? Yeah. So cage putting cage back then wasn't the thing either. So one other thing, a tragic event, the Yatabe. They stopped doing that because there was one accident with a, I forgot the Honda that had a bad crash and they didn't have a cage. Back in the day where June Auto came out for Bonneville, land speed, right? And I was, um, the trust was the sponsor and helped out on the powertrain side. And the chief uh, R&D guy that built this car and I worked under was also part of that um, support and he invited me to go out there for basically translated. And it was an R33, Hyper Lemon, June Auto. It got to, to the target. The Option Magazine came out, the whole staff. Going up to, you know, 300 mile per hour type of run, you know, they showed up with a bolt-in, you know, Cusco cage. We went through tech and they're like, you can't be running that. Like, you know, so that night we had to like find a local shop and took like, they didn't even have the right material, but they did like a city maintenance garage. And they, we took, you know, bars from like street sign, like posts and welded in some parts just to kind of Mickey Mouse the, the cage. But, you know, they don't know, you know, have the material or, you know, the technology wasn't really into Japan to making like the motorsport grade, you know, cage. So it wasn't really a thing back then. The Cusco and Safety 21 had like these bolt-in cage, but it was never like a full welded, you know, cage unless you're in a GT uh, class, you know, motorsport you kind know, of spec. So street cars didn't really have like a legit, you know, racing spec cage. So when they used to bring cars to drag race too, if it went too fast, it's like, okay, you can't run anymore because it doesn't have the proper cage um, or the license for the NHRA. So that was like, you know, early 90s and then kind of caught on afterwards. But you, know, you see today, like some of the D1 and Formula D Japan cars, you know, they're built kind of like how it's built over here too. So it took some time for them to kind of catch on some of those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what's all this down here? This data oh, link unit. Th those are the control boxes for all these gauges. 
So that box right there is uh, one of the project that I built, uh, worked on in Japan. I made that box back in 95. But it's just kind of to proudly display all of the boxes. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's no other place to, to put them. But yeah, it's all the contr control boxes for each gate. So these are all warning gauges oh, and peak hold. So that's incredible. I love that they're all matching too. Yeah. Even huh. the dash got custom made. So it goes up to 360 kilometers and, you know, red lines at 11,000 RPM, but goes, you know, all the way to 13. No way. So what does this rev to? Uh, it, it went past 10,000. Really? Yeah. So at the Yatabe tr track, they'll yeah. even launch it at 8,000 RPM to launch, you know, and then they'll, they'll take it you know, as high as possible. But, you know, they were pushing it back then too. And, you know, I sent you a link to a video on uh, Instagram too, you know, doing that whole bank Yatabe track. And a lot of the times they'll die, uh, Daijiro will just come back with a uh, car just smoking. Before the first shakedown, we were on the dyno and we went through two motors that night and we had to swap another motor, you know, overnight. So it was, it was pretty crazy how, you know, what we had to go through. But uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why this is, R33 is my favorite GTR out of all the, you know, a lot of people prefer 32 or the 34, but 33 has a special you know, place in my heart for sure. So what, what are we looking at here in terms of electronics? First of all, mm -hmm. it's amazing to me that it still has a radio. Yeah. Uh, and then what, what's going on here? So this is the, the Profec B-Spec. So this is the boost controller. So This was a, from that era. It's been updated once. Okay. Yeah. And this is the Rebic 3, is the sub-injector controller. It's <laughs> so crazy. So that... The second set of uh, six injectors on the injector, I mean the intake manifold, you see two rails. One of the rails are controlled by, by that injector. By that. And right. then what does the knob do? So it has uh, different uh, RPM when you want it to kick in at certain, you know, boost. So the main, main injectors are controlled by the ECU, but if you pass beyond that, then, you know, we activate the the sub-injectors to add more fuel. And we're able to pretty much write a map for that. But yeah, super old technology. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. how much? I don't even know if it's hooked up right now. Right, but yeah. but it's crazy. It's like, how much resolution is this? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. like yeah. it's it's kind of insane that like mm. you could just. I remember when even my car back in 95, I had a 240SX that I turbocharged and had 750 horsepower. Um, Jim Wolf did the original ECU, but it wasn't enough to control the injectors that I needed for the, the power that I wanted. So I added sub injectors and I made a graph and started writing down the numbers as I was tuning. So, that was, you know, that's pretty much, you know, the old school incredible way of, so instead of sub injector on each port, still, we used to even put it on like the charge pipe. Kind of like the nitrous foggers to add more fuel to atomize you know just in the pipe so we could just run like one or two injectors instead of six so yeah, that's what we used to do back then that's crazy yeah um so then tell me about the transmission this yeah. is special so this is the trust uh, sequential transmission before this trust came out with the uh, trust six p you know regular h pattern gear set to upgrade the regular you know, RB26 transmission. Um, and that was pretty popular, but because it was dog gears, it was super loud. And when the 34s came, you know, people started using the Getrag ones. So that kind of phased out that product. But this one is made by Quaif, especially made for Trust back then. Uh, it was pretty popular Trust uh, six-speed transmission before like Hollinger came out, I believe. But then when Hollinger launched, then that kind of phased out this this seat. Huh. Interesting. I need to trim this guy a little bit. What is that for? It's the just reverse? The, the reverse lockout okay. cable. 
Oh, got it. So cool. So, you can't drive this on the street yet, then? Um, I mean, we could. I drove it around the block the other day. Oh. Can you lift up the, the wing? I'll open the trunk. Yeah, sure. It's super heavy because oh, the sh wow. shock gave out, I think. This is really heavy. Look kind of like the old school, you know, fuel system. You could let go now. Okay. I'll stay up. So it has a surge tank, so there's a lift pump that pumps into here. And then we've got the, the Bosch 44s. Feeding. Three of them? Yeah, three of them feeding. Huh. It's also crazy that all of this was painted mm -hmm. on the inside. So, so it still like has Hikus then, this car, huh? Yeah. Huh, wow. It's so much, so many things were left alone. More of a, they took out the AC, but you know, the, the whole concept was, was the, a street car, kind of the ultimate street car, right? Yeah. yeah, that's great. I love that. Hmm. That is so The cool. rear panels has that big Kmod speaker grill, but there's no speakers in there. Look at that. It's all for the original show. sticker yeah, the, t power grady yeah so these t67 t78 t88 was the turbo back in the day um early 90s to probably late 90s um, a lot of the tuners would be using these bigger turbos now they got big you know garrett thumper turbos and these were like one of the biggest ones that you could get back in the Mid nineties, so can we uh, go for a ride around the yeah. block then? Yeah, yeah, we could go. Start it up. Let's hear it then. Sounds good. Yeah, not that idle huh? is pretty cool. Yeah. There's a pretty aggressive cam in there. Wow, that diff is aggressive, yeah. huh? So it has a Owens Gaiken front and rear diff. Front and rear. You gotta go super. That is super aggressive. Do they lock the center diff then? Um, the initial torque is set really high. Front is too low. Yeah. That bumper overhang is crazy. Yeah. The interior is just so wild. So it's funny because everything else on this car, it could be of era. Whoa. Yeah. That sound is crazy. <laughs> like any other uh, dog gear gearbox. So like Samsung is kind of like that too, right? Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I don't have the shift, shift yeah, indicator. So you so don't know where I, you are. I forget what gear I'm... Jeez. Just the transmission sound alone is pretty wild. This is so wild. I can't believe this was built this long ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's crazy is this is probably the the most I've driven this Re car. Really? 
because I never really got to drive it back then, right? Because we had the whole R&D team and, and Big and Boss would never let me drive it back then. Now you're the Big Boss. This is so rowdy. I mean, I only went up to about 6,000 RPM. We still have to check the tune and everything. Yeah, so it's just the just the transmission alone yeah. is just so. It's it's just extra. <laughs> That's the only way I can explain it. But also, looking from the outside, it's just so wild looking. You know, the color, the sparkles. Yeah. So everybody's like, "What the hell is that down the street?" I've driven this, <laughs> believe it or not. Amazing. Dude, thank you so much for yeah. taking me. Thanks for coming down. Yeah, I just, every one of your cars that we feature, it's they're special, they have a really good story, but this one has so much history. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Out of everything that, you know, I got my hands on, this is definitely one of the, the one for sure. With that nostalgic, uh, you know, feel to, you know, taking me back to what twenty seven years ago, when I had hair. You know, twenty four, you know, going, going to Japan for six months, and you know, it really brings back all the memories. And you know, here I am, you know, today, still being able to run Grady here and still do some fun stuff and, you know, builds. Fun projects. Well, well, it's kind of interesting because when you say 27 years ago, um, we're starting from zero here in the U.S., right? right. So because, because of the 25-year law, yeah. we have to relive this period. Yeah. The exact same thing. It's the exact same thing the Japanese uh, lived mm. back then. Mm -hmm but it's in the US for the first time. You know, right. we're getting the, you know, we first got the R32s, mm -hmm. now 33s, and then in a couple of years, right. we're gonna relive the 34s. Right. You know, but just roaming the streets. Right, but everything's so much easier today, and so much information out there, easily accessible to, you know, go online, and you could read about RB26, or the transmission, or, you know, fuel management, and all the parts that's, still around that supported this platform it's still available and uh you know makes it even that much more fun to to play with and you know one thing i think my thing today is more like oem plus kind of restoring and keeping things cool but you know add few you know touches yeah. not to the extreme like this but because a build like this makes it possible for you know what we have today yeah, you know, so. of course. So that, that's kind of like your, uh, um, uh, your, I guess, the theme mm -hmm. on the EF that you built that yeah. we featured. Mm -hmm. It was OEM plus yeah. plus. Like it was as clean as possible, mm -hmm. and it, even to the point where you hid so many things to make it look OEM. But yeah. it's completely beyond that. Right. It's so good. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. No, and thank you. and also another thing now. 
Um, you guys are getting back into Honda's big too, huh? We're starting to. I mean, a lot of the guys here even, you know, I'll show you my 85 CRX too, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of the, you know, we're all enthusiasts here and a lot of us started from Honda's. So kind of going back to the roots, so to speak. So we have been developing some parts for it, but because of the whole supply and there's so much, you know, backlog on the production so some of the new things that we did um, it's kind of on the back burner right now but hopefully soon we'll start launching more of the Honda stuff like the old school Honda stuff yeah. 10th gen Civics like the Type R and all that's been one of our top sellers um, but I want to bring back some of the old school stuff like the 90s and you know, the 90s are super hot right now and you see the prices of you know, some of these Civics and Integra's going crazy right so there's a lot of the uh, market and a lot of people are starting to spend more money to restore some of these cars too. So, you know, we want to come up with more products to kind of support that as well. So even like these GTRs, the 90s cars, the Supras, the GTRs, the, even down to 300ZX, just, you know, we're getting increase. So we're going to try to kind of come up with more products to support that. Yeah. Uh, and, and more and more, I think there's not that many option for new car for like a tuner market uh, 400 or the, the z the new z we are definitely looking forward to um but other than the supra and the new 86 then the z's come in and i heard supra's coming out with the manual but other than that there's not really an option for you know the tuner market but all these 90s cars are you know that's why i think it's getting more more popular and some of these 25 year old cars coming in from japan to add to that but the thing is like back then it, it was something that potentially could be overlooked and it was if it was a 300 zx mm. it might be have it, it maybe was not loved as much but now it's sought after and even if it's in the worst condition mm. it's worth saving yeah and it's sure. actually um coveted even more so mm -hmm. than before yeah because of the rarity and right. because it's actually something special mm -hmm. and also it's uh, like our um, something that we we liked you know as a kid but we couldn't afford yeah kind of thing yeah you even see like an old celica all track right back then it was like oh yeah it's celica but now he's like oh shit, yeah. look at that yeah. you know I, I go to top rank all the time and i'll see all kinds of different cars and you know we i just saw the all track there like I was blown away. Yeah, super cool. You know? Yeah. So, you know, stuff like that. It's like we, we need to keep that going and, you know, preserve some of these things. Yeah. You know, to keep it going. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank as you. As always.